I am Angelica McGee, uh, interviewing with Alexandra Leon. And we are interviewing Peter B. Gallagher. And today is May 27th, 2023. First question, how did you first hear about the Florida Folk Festival? Uh, <clears throat> 1971, I was a uh, junior <clears throat> at the University of Florida and uh, I had a one of the classes I had to take was broadcasting. And uh, I was going for, a uh, I wanted to get a degree in journalism. I'd been a writer, already had jobs with newspapers, even as a kid. And um, um, one of my teachers was Don Grooms, Professor Don Grooms. And his office was in the state, the journalism department was in the stadium. So all the walls had worked like, like this, you know. And um, uh, he, I went to see him in his office one day, and he had a gu couple guitars in there. And I said, oh, you play guitar? Because I, I was also play guitar. He says, yeah. He, he says, uh, have you ever been to the Florida Folk Festival? Yeah, I really didn't, hadn't heard anything about it. I grew up in um, Cocoa, and it just wasn't a thing that anyone knew about. And um, uh, no. And he said, why don't you come on out as my guest? You know, come on up there. So I did, I got a couple of friends of mine, One, a guy was a banjo player, another guy was a mandolin player. We used to informally play. And we went up to the festival and he just got us up on stage and, you know, it was a very informal deal back in the 70s. It uh, wasn't as organized as it is today. And, um, and, that's, and so I've been coming to, ever since. I've, I've only missed it one or two times in all those years. Uh, and that's and of course uh, um, it was uh, we were we were playing bluegrass music and of course bluegrass was one of the big musics that was at the early Florida folk festivals especially and um, from from that um, I maintained a uh, like a double career as a musician and as also as a writer you know wrote different newspapers magazines that sort of thing. Did you write songs as well? Mm-hmm. Songs like folk songs that you would perform here? Songs. Oh, folk yeah. Songs? Oh, yeah. I'm going to be going to the uh, gazebo in a little while and playing all my songs, you know. That, but I, have, I don't know how many I have, over 100 uh, yeah. Florida, Florida songs, you know. Could you tell us about the community at the festival? Back then? Or, Back then or now, or now? Any, okay. Any choice. Well, it's a very, it's a, it's, a, it is a, uh, it's a little city that forms every, every year, and uh, it, it, uh, I'd say ninety percent of the people here I don't see except one, except during this festival. Um, in those early days, um, uh, especially when I moved to St. Pete, there was never anybody from Tampa Bay area. Very rarely do you see anybody from Tampa Bay area up here. And uh, but <clears throat> uh, over the last many years, it's uh, a lot of people. I see a lot more people that I know now, uh, even even in other places, because I run. Uh, I uh, uh, I'm a member of a band called the Florida Boys. This year they didn't come up, so I'm with the Greengrass Revival. That was my first band that I played with. So every year I'd play with the Greengrass Revival, and then I also would play with the Florida Boys once they started up years later, and. Um, we we run a, we uh, we have Florida Folk Night at the um, this uh, we've had it probably ten different places over the years and it, currently we're at the Bayboro Brewing Company. Um, I also um, had a radio show at WMNF Community Radio in Tampa for twenty some years, um, I think eighteen years something like that, and then. Uh, for the last couple of years, I've been with Radio St. Pete in the shows called the Florida Folk Show. So it's become my brand, Florida Folk. And um, I'm probably one of the few broadcasters that, that deal with that uh, subject. And um, I've had many f co famous co-hosts over the year, like Bobby Hicks and different, different people like that, Rayford Stark. Other musicians, Jim Mason, um, and um, 
even even the, the guy I do the radio show with uh, uh, that's up here with me now, Tim Valley. He's a regular co-host on that show, and we just uh, deal with, mostly just with uh, Florida music. You say, well, what is Florida folk music? And I always say this. Well, Bobby Hicks said, I know it when I see it. It's a feeling. It's like Texas music, you know. Could you tell us about some traditions you have when you come to the festival? Well, back in the days when I used to camp, I don't camp anymore out there. And I don't really go, when I'm up here, I'm so busy, I don't have a chance to go swimming or canoeing or anything like that. Uh, a big tradition we, a lot of us used to have was, uh, um, on, on the Monday morning, we'd, uh, there'd be a, a big dinner, a breakfast for the, uh, all the performers and volunteers. And as soon as that was over, we'd leave and uh, go, go down to Itchitucky Springs and uh, float down the Itchitucky River, uh, one of the clearest waters, rivers in the world. And uh, you just rent a uh, inner tube and float down. And that, that, was, that was like the end of the festival for us, even though we weren't up here. You know, so we we have thirty or forty people, and we'd rent we'd rent uh, inner tubes. They tie you to the top of your car, and you go to the park, and they had the name of the company on it, and float down the river, and, and they uh, a tram would take you back. I think they they still do that to this day. Yeah. Back then, you know, it was um, now it's a state park, but back then it wasn't. So people would climb on the banks and party out there, and and. Be drinking up and down the river, but it's you know it's a little more he, a little more uh, behaved now. Now it's a state park, but um, that's one of the only in and, and the in the, and the tradition of the uh, the campground. You know, there's always certain people always camped in the same place. Will McLean was always in the same place in those days, and um, you you always tried to find your what what your place was. So it was like that. It was like visiting a, a trailer park or a community or something where everybody lived, always lived in the same place. And uh, that's about all I can think, think of. Uh, the, whole, the whole place is a tradition, you know. Just, just coming up here is a tradition. Uh, I, I took my kids here when they were young and little, and uh, uh, if you had to create a Florida folk festival family motto, what would it be? I guess it's something to the effect of the, the music will save everybody, especially folk music. There's people here that uh, you, you'd never know how they are in their real life, but when they're out here, you know they're the person here. Sometimes you run into somebody in their in their real life, you don't really you almost recognize them or they're different or whatever else, but out here everybody's friendly. I don't recall ever there being a fight fight breaking out or you know, um, it's just, uh, I think, you know, there's other, other festivals around the state that are, uh, um, uh, that have been around for a long, long time, you know, and of course this, this festival has spawned off other ones like the Gamble Rogers Festival, the Will McLean Festival, stuff like that. And it's like a mini version of this, you know, and, um, even some individuals like the uh, the Ch Frankie J and the Chicken Parade, they have a place called the Farm up in uh, outside of Brooksville, and it's big enough where everybody can camp there. And there's a stage there, very similar to to here, you know. Um, and I think uh, I, I think in the early early days, the, the campground used to be right out in here, and then of course they moved it down down the road a little bit because it was there was ran out of room. But it was cool to be able to, can't you, right at your campsite, you could watch music going on. But there wasn't 13 or 15 stages, whatever they have now. And for a long time, um, 
uh, there weren't any blacks at the festival. And then um, the first one, I brought the first, a guy named Blind Johnny Brown. He was uh, in a nursing home and I was uh, working for the St. Pete Times and I was doing a story about the Neighborly Center. I used to come pick him up and he, he was there with all, uh, people of all color in St. Petersburg and somebody said, this man's a famous guitar player. But he didn't have a guitar, so I went out to a pawn shop and bought a cheap guitar and brought it to him, and he could play it. And it turned out he was, uh, he toured with uh, uh, Jimmy Reed, and he wrote the song, I'll be glad when you're dead, you rascal you. When you're dead and gone, me and your old lady gonna get it on. I'll be glad when you're dead, you rascal you. That was a, that was a famous song back then. And um, so I said, man, this guy's a real folk legend, and they didn't, they didn't want him to come up here, and I let it be known. I said, if you if you not if you're not going to let him get come up here, give me a good reason for it. That's going to be my column in the paper next week. And then what's going to happen? They let him in. I also brought in uh, uh, Diamond Teeth Mary, the blues singer. She was uh, uh, Peggy Bulger, the uh, who was the director of this festival called me up and asked me if would I give this lady a ride because I, I lived in St. Pete, she lived in Bradenton. And I had my little daughter with me. She held up a tape recorder and I interviewed her on the way up there and she's telling me that she's formerly known as Diamond Teeth Mary. And she had uh, gum foil on her teeth, but she had removed the diamonds over the years to, make, to pay for things, you know, once her career ended. And uh, she had a new career. She went on from there. Then she got in the Florida Folk Heritage Award. She traveled to Europe. Um, she, we had we took her down to Miami Beach every Christmas Eve for years. And uh, she'd play till three or four o'clock in the morning to Tobacco Road. And uh, there's, I've got a podcast series of them called uh, floridafolkshow.com and you can see movies of her that we took um, the Florida Folk Festival movie there's one done in uh, 1994 I think and uh, this, there's a segment in there about her but she was playing in bars when she was she died at the age of uh, 99 and she was playing in bars and places like that all the way up to them but she didn't want anybody to know in her town because she, she didn't want the preacher at the, at the church to get mad because she was playing the blues. But when we went to talk to him, he, he didn't have a problem with it at all, you know, but I never told her I talked to him about it, you know. And then another, and then she told me about another piano player, another guy, Blind Willie James. He was the original member of the, of the five, five Blind Boys famous, famous gospel group. And he ended up in St. Petersburg blind and living in a place with his uh, wife. And um, he reunited with her and then he was her piano player. And he said, a light, uh, he quoted the Bible, a light that shineth upon a hill cannot be hidden. That was his comment. I said, well, she doesn't like anybody at the church to know. He goes, they know. A light that shineth upon a hill can't be hidden. And that's, that's what she was. And the, and the Florida Folk Festival enriched all of that, all of that. It's the most, one of the most spectacular nights ever at the Florida Folk Festival is the night that the power went out when she was on stage, right in the middle of a song. She didn't even, she didn't stop singing. The drummer kept playing. Of course, the guitars wouldn't work. The electric guitars, the piano player kept playing. And everybody in that audience, shining lighters. It was unbelievable. For like an hour, half an hour, 30, 40 minutes, she sang, did her whole routine. And I don't know if uh, somebody could probably tell you what year that was. I can't remember. Because she was up here for 15 years. Every year she came to the Florida Folk Festival. And she sat, when she wasn't playing, she sat right up on the, on the uh, stage. Cousin Thelma, the director, the founder of the festival, always sat in a chair right on the back of the stage. And she would 
try to keep you, oh, you, one more song, one more song. And, you know, she tried to keep things going. And Mary sat right next to her. And when, uh, when Mary sang Old Folks at Home, she sang it in the original lyrics, the uh, Stephen Foster lyrics, old darkies and all that stuff, you know. Of course, that's been cleaned up. That's been, the state song doesn't have that in it now. But, when, but she didn't know that. She sang that song her whole, her whole life, and those were the words to it. She didn't take any offense. And then one time, we, uh, we, when we were filming the movie of her, Diamond Teeth Mary's Life, we, uh, I got up to stage before I introduced her, and I, I told everybody, we're shooting a documentary, and um, so if you don't want to be in the, the film, don't be in the audience right now because we're going to be shoot, shooting. So she got up there to play, but she was angry, wouldn't talk to me the whole show. Finally, at the end of the show, I said, I said uh, what's wrong with you? What's the matter? I heard what you said. She, saw, she thought I said that here we have the only darkie in the show. She heard the word documentary and it came into her mind that I said to, that she was the only darkie in the show. I said, my God, I didn't say that. Yes, you did. She was just, just a very, very, uh, for someone in the late 80s, she was active, bright-minded, you know. And finally, uh, then the other thing about her is that she had a story that she, she was working on a garbage truck in uh, Memphis, Tennessee. And that big mama Thornton found her and took her off the garbage truck, garbage truck and adopted her. She's only 12 years old. And she stayed with Big Mama Thornton for years. They, she learned, she, Big Mama Thornton heard her singing off the truck. And she, she told her driver, stop, I want to I want to listen to this girl. And she really was like homeless. And so years, years later, um, Big Mama Thornton, Odetta, um, I don't know, I can't remember the other two, were doing a show in Gertie's Folk City in New York City. And Mary had gotten a job in the, you know, in a, uh, and this all happened at the Florida Folk Festival. Somebody saw her at the Florida Folk Festival, and she got a job as a singer in a, a Broadway play called The Medicine Show. And she was the lady that came on at the end and sang, Well, the Saints Come Marching In. And, um, and down the street, while they were there, there was Odetta playing at the Gertie's Folk City, a folk bar. So we took her over there, and it was packed. And I talked my way in, and Mary was right behind me. She always had a, always carried a handkerchief because she was missing a thumb catfish. She was fishing catfish, cat, the top of a catfish will cut your finger off if you're not care careful. And she had that hanky, you know, and, um, and Odetta was up there, and she looked at her, and they looked at each other. Because I always thought that it was a BS story. I, I couldn't believe that that was true. And uh, they had like a little reunion, and they get her, got her up on stage. And Odetta says, "This is Mary Smith," because McLean was her ma made her name uh, after she's married. Mary Smith. I took her off a garbage truck in Memphis, Tennessee. Man, a chill went down me. Oh my God! All these stories that she's been telling are probably true, you know. And she got up there and sang with them. Those are special things that I would have never experienced if I had not gotten into the folk music world through the Florida Folk, folk Festival. I think there's a lot of other people I have stories too like that. So. Who do you look forward to seeing the most every year? Seeing the what? Seeing the most every year. Who do you look forward to seeing? I don't know. I, it, um, well, for the last many years, John McEwen, you know, I became friends with him. In fact, he's driving up now, and I'm going to take him over there and do interviewing him for the radio show in a little while. Um, all the, all, a lot of the old guard is gone by now. Will McLean, Don Grooms, Frank Thomas, um, 
Chief Billy, he doesn't even come up here anymore. He asked me the other day, besides me, and he says, besides me and you, who are the other old characters out here? Now I'm one of the older ones. Dale Kreider, but he doesn't, you know, he doesn't really come out, come around. Which is weird. I never thought of it in terms of that, you know. But it's good to, to get, good to get these things down for that very reason, you know. Ranger Kibben gave a huge advertisement for you on the show. We brought her on there. She gave the whole reason why that why you were here doing this, you know. What time is it? Twelve forty-six. How much? Twelve. Oh, okay, okay. What songs would be in the Florida Folk Family Songbook? Which ones? Yes. Which songs? Like. Which songs would you say would belong in the in the like songbook of the Florida Folk Festival? Well, I'm Florida. Need I say more? Bob from Bobby X should be the state. That should be the state song. I think you know. Why is that? Because it, it's everything is in there. The old folks at home only only gives the plantation life story of Florida. You know, I'm, I'm Florida talks about. Uh, you know, I'm I'm Spanish. I'm British. I'm Indian. You know, he talks about all all the people that have lived in Florida, and talks about the uh, the orange groves and the um, the the, um, the the Key West conks and riding out hurricanes on Duval Street. You know, the tarpon jumping down in Chukaluski, where the Gulf and the Everglades meet. He's got all his, you know, he talks about the whole state. Good, yeah. So could you tell us about someone you met at the festival who had like a big influence on your music? Well, I would say, uh, Will McLean, Frank Thomas, Bobby Hicks. It, because it never it 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 never occurred to me to write songs about Florida. Oddly enough, in the beginning, when I was first starting out, I was just playing bluegrass songs that you know weren't necessarily about any place, but they were never about Florida. And. Um, and then I thought, well, this is, that's what, what's supposed to be happening. Now, what's the air I breathe? What's the ground I'm walking on in Florida? There's a lot of stories in it, a lot of songs here. That's why when I, I have these, uh, this, this radio show, these, some of these people come on there and they don't. I said, well, sing, sing me a Florida song. And they get, they get antagonistic about it. Why do, why do you do that? Why should I sing a Florida song? Because this is the Florida Folk Show. I give them, I, Frank, Frank used to give assignments. I want, I want you to write a song about this. He would give that assignment to other people, like including myself. Write, write a song about Rosewood, write a song about this or that. And I, I started doing it myself. You know, sometimes you never see them again. I said, I, you know, there's enough relationship songs out there, you know. <laughs> what valuable lessons have you learned from other Florida Folk Festival family members? Well, I guess just the... Uh, Pay attention to what's going on in your state. Try to see everything you can. You drive it along, stop, up, stop, and look at the markers. You know, um, realize that people are different in different parts of the state, but but they all come out here, and you meet a, a full range of people.
people you might not even like in real life, but out here, you know. So what is your favorite stage at the festival, your favorite music act? Probably the, the gazebo or the Seminole camp. <clears throat> Why? Because you're close to the people and they don't really have, uh, you know, mics and mic, mic problems and that sort of thing, you know, sound problems. Um, it's like a, you're closer to the people than, than uh, most of the other stages that they have to use sound at. What is a typical day like for you at the festival? See, there's, there's, it's never typical for me. Like this is, I've never done a, the radio show in this fashion. I've, we did it last year, but it wasn't like this. And um, some one year I, was, I spent working on a crew that did a movie about the Florida Folk Festival. You know, that film that run that run about a hundred times all over the world. You know, on uh, public stations. What's your favorite song at the festival? I couldn't say because the songs are attached to people and now they're not there anymore. <clears throat> I don't know. Do you have a favorite memory from the festival? The one about the uh, um. the lights, Donald's Mary, the power went out. What is your go-to food? Go-to food? At the festival. I'm not a big fan of uh, festival food. At home, I used to, I used to, you know, eat everything, but now in my older age, everything has to be organic. I don't do, I don't do gluten. I have the best cook in the world. And she, um, we do, we just eat, very rare that we don't eat anything organic, but well, up here, nothing, practically nothing is organic, you know, and uh, you have to survive, but um, we eat mostly fish. Anymore, yeah. Is there any wisdom or advice you would pass on to a younger participant or performer at the festival? I'd say keep your mind on Florida. Keep, keep your mind on uh, uh, what is it about the why? Why do you live here? Why? Why? Uh, when I was a kid, I used to want to move to New York all the time. I was fascinated with it. I grew up in Fort Lauderdale. I was born in Fort Lauderdale, but I was there long enough until I was like 11 that I knew the, about the New York Yankees train there. My favorite team, I wanted to go to New York because Florida didn't have any of that. No baseball teams, no football teams, nothing, you know. And, and uh, But then, uh, uh, Finally, I ended up in St. Pete, which to me was a big town that was, was a small town at the same time. Now, of course, it's going through a huge spurt. It's really losing its small town nature, you know. Sometimes I think I'd just like to live up here in White Springs or Micanope or one of those towns, you know. But, but then you see the outskirts, the big new subdivisions and squeezing that little town in, you know. That's, uh, I'm, I'm, like I say, I have a song called Chuckalusky that I say, you know, my, my granddaughters are not gonna see what I've, saw, what I've seen or what I'm seeing today. But what's wrong with like appreciating today, you know? Uh, oh, but ain't it beautiful today? What well, soon one day the man will come and take this all away. He'll throw all those barnacled crab traps way out in the Florida Bay. 
Oh, but ain't it beautiful today? In other words, enjoy it while it's here. Blessed. Yeah. Do you so, have any last questions or questions that you wish we'd asked? <laughs> no. Any last thoughts? Oh, um, you know, I think that was last thing I said. That's That came over me one day when I was, I was down in Chukaluski, which is almost as far down in southwest Florida as you can go. And it was at the, uh, outside of, uh, I think the post office or there, there was a bulletin board. It had a picture of a, a tra old trailer. The step was broken. There was an old washing machine out in the front yard. Weeds growing out of it. Just a crappy looking place, you know. It was for sale, you know. $650,000 because of the property was right on the water. And I said, oh my God, what's, someone's gonna buy that for that amount of money and what's gonna be there after it gets bought? Something that's not gonna fit in that town. And that's when I started, I got depressed about it. And then I thought, that's when I came to, it came to me like, I might as well enjoy it today. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Sure. You're welcome.